It's great to see a bunch of familiar names there on the attendee list. So thanks so much for joining us today. For our, um, uh, we're really excited today um, to bring you uh, a webinar on Medicare Direct Contracting and You. Um, and so historically, it's not been easy for our community to kind of manage their, their Medicare patients um, under a model that makes sense to them. Um, and so since CMS announced the direct contact contracting entity pilot, um, there's been a lot of interest and sort of a lot of interest from our community um, just about about this program and for its potential to potentially enable them to care for their Medicare patients in a way that they're more comfortable with and that maps to their their models and you know, the, the direct care model more appropriately. And so today we're really excited to um, bring to you the Pearl Health team who we're excited to partner with you really just to help educate um, our community, um, help uh, bring them up to speed as to what this program entails um, and also kind of help you better understand whether or not this is a program that you would be um, could benefit from and what the kind of pros and cons and trade-offs are um, of joining this program. In addition to that, Pearl has um, is also um, you know is, is potentially a partner for you in this journey, and help you kind of actually join the program if there's interest and 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 kind of make sure that you're um, kind of uh, achieving the objectives laid out by the program. Um, so before we kind of jump in here, I just wanted to make some quick intros. Um, first of all, um, introducing. Jennifer Rabiner, who is our um, is the Chief Product Officer at Pearl Health. And um, prior to joining Pearl, she was actually uh, the head of product at Hint. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm going to be sort of, uh, I'm, I'm very, very excited to um, partner with her here because she is an absolute rock star at Hint. And so when she went to Pearl, I, was, I knew that I, I was really keen to figure out if there's a way to continue that relationship. Um, but prior to Hint, she was also a Senior Product Leader at Athena Health. And her product experience spans um, value-based care in both the health system and independent provider segments, as well as direct primary care, obviously through her experience at, um, at Hint, but also prior to that, she spent a lot of time looking at direct primary care at, um, at Athena as well. Um, and so her vast experience um, also includes a healthcare revenue cycle, a process optimization and system implementation at Deloitte and triage consulting. Um, as well as a pharmaceutical reimbursement strategy and operations at Milliman Pharmaceuticals. Um, so Jen holds a Master's of Healthcare Admin from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a BA in Social Welfare from the University um, of UCAL Berkeley. So super excited to be partnering up with you again, Jen. Um, and also um, Ankit uh, Patel, is, who's the co-founder here and president of Pell Health. And so um, Ankit was previously VP of Provider Alignment at Clover Health um, and uh, the VP of Network at Clover. Um, and prior to that, he was also a senior advisor at the CMS Innovation Center, where he worked on various value-based payment models, including the Pioneer ACO program um, and the Maryland All-Payer Waiver. And so impressively, Ankit began his career as a healthcare attorney uh, for an academic medical center. And he received his BA in uh, international studies at the University of South Carolina, um, and uh, and and his um, and his JD from U University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And one thing I'll just mention is that there's actually an, an Ankit Patel in Michigan who is conducted for Medicare fraud, um, and that's not this Ankit. <laughs> just to clear that up today, um, uh, given given the topic of today's um, conversation. So uh, without further ado, I'm really excited to hand off to um, Anka and Jen to share all their insights and kind of help help you understand the kind of pros and cons of this program. So over to you folks. Great, well, thank you so much, Zach, for the introduction. Really nice to have everyone here um, on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, so why don't we kind of get into um, a little bit of the background on, on Medicare and the kind of policy direction um, that, that we're trying to solve for here. And, and ultimately, when, when Medicare had started this push following the passage of the Affordable Care Act, um, there was a big sort of understanding and recognition 
that physicians, primary care doctors, really held the key to managing costs and managing better um, healthcare outcomes. And, and I think what you see here is even when you go out into the physician community, an overwhelming number of, of physicians will tell you that they believe that they play a prominent role, if not the key role, in managing the healthcare outcomes and the healthcare expenditures of their patient panel. And, and yet, for all of the work that we've been kind of doing over the last decade in, in kind of the rubric of value-based care, we still find that it's not even a majority of physicians who are out there are in arrangements where they are getting properly rewarded um, for, uh, you know, improving outcomes, reducing costs, and, and getting the kind of upside, as we would say, um, from these kind of value-based care arrangements. And so what does it actually mean? Um, what we see here in, in this next slide is the average PCP, right, accepting insurance and kind of living in that um, insurance world of multiple payers, probably taking home somewhere on average around 225 a year, but yet across the full um, kind of book of the system on their panel, there's actually about $10 million worth of spending that is happening across, you know, hospital admissions, other surgical procedures, you know, specialty visits. Um, and, and really what's happening is that primary care has the ability to kind of control this entire um, iceberg here. And yet oftentimes there's a lot of burden that's being placed on them asking them to take on more of this responsibility, but they don't often have the structure um, or the tools in place to do that, nor are they properly being sort of award, rewarded um, for doing that, that type of care. And so here's the world that we live in today. If you're in you know, the traditional fee-for-service environment, you know, getting rates from an insurance plan, and, and I think many of you are kind of familiar with what this world looks like, is that you've got kind of rate negotiations that you're taking on with your uh, specific, you know, payer, um, you know, contracts that you have, and it's generally a fee-for-service arrangement. And then the net result of that is that you've got, you know, on average, what you're going to see is about $83 per visit, and you're just on this like hamster wheel, and it's just an assembly line. And because your revenue and your cash flows that you need to kind of operate your practice are tied to this kind of fee-for-service billing, it's just an assembly line. It's come in, see the patient do a visit for 10 minutes, do a referral out if they need additional care, and you're just kind of seeing patients on this $83 assembly line without really being able to kind of manage um, care in, in a more meaningful way. And I think the reason that we have been very excited to partner and, and to have conversations with um, the DPC community is they've already figured this out. And, and, and they've kind of figured out that the world here looks like essentially what is kind of like a portfolio management for your patients um, actual clinical needs. We know that there are some patients who are healthier, who need to have timely access, but may not need to have the same level of follow-up and can have a visit for 20 to 30 minutes. Maybe they're kind of more technology savvy and can engage with your practice through text messaging or, you know, a FaceTime video call, um, you know, but there are other patients who may not be ambulatory, who need a one to two hour visit, who need um, additional follow-up, and the flexibility that has come um, from certain financial arrangements, you know, can allow for the proper allocation so that pay doctors can spend the right amount of time with their patients providing the right care um, in the right moment, rather than having to feel like everyone has to go through this kind of what we described as that $83 um, assembly, assembly line. And, and I think there's a lot of different models here. You know, I, I'll let Jen later on in the presentation talk a lot about, um, you know, the direct uh, primary care community, but we also think that direct contracting in this new Medicare program is probably the first step towards actually creating a pathway for doctors to think in these new terms and actually think in terms of um, the model that the DPC um, um, community has already figured out. So if we jump to the next slide here, we can talk just a little bit about um, what this direct contracting evolution looks like. And here's just kind of, for, for those of you not familiar with, um, you know, with, with the Medicare kind of uh, uh, alphabet soup of acronyms, um, you know, the bottom line is that the Affordable Care Act, when it was passed in, in 2010, gave the agency the authority to create a host of different programs that were intended to reward physicians for providing better care and reducing the cost um, of the Medicare population. And, and there's a whole, again, alphabet soup here of all these different types of arrangements and, and payments. And I think the one thing to kind of take away from all of these is that most of these uh, programs 
we're still living and sitting on top of uh, the fee-for-service infrastructure, the fee-for-service chassis. And so while doctors were being rewarded for better outcomes, they're still living in this world of kind of dealing with complicated billing codes, making sure they're doing the right bill for the right service, and any bonus payments or, you know, value um, that the doctors are being rewarded for, you know, would come in, in the form of this bonus check that would happen, you know, 18 months, you know, down into the future, not something that could actually help kind of manage uh, practice revenue and practice finances you know, on a month over month basis. And a lot of that has now changed with the drug contracting model. Um, and, and Jen will talk about that in a moment. And so if we jump to this next slide here, you know, I, I think that what we have learned over kind of 10 years of, of a lot of these kind of new models, and I think where uh, Medicare is trying to go is one, you know, the building block of primary care is still primary care physicians. We need to kind of continue to focus on how we reduce the total cost of care um, and, and reduce the expenditures for not just Medicare, but these you know, healthcare dollars are an example of patients utilizing the healthcare system. We need to make you know, fee-for-service is not the kind of pathway that we want doctors to sit in. Um, and we need to kind of focus more on outcomes. But then more importantly, specifically with some of these more recent programs and, and with kind of the guidance that's coming out of the, of the new administration, is really you know, emphasizing um, health equity and kind of closing the gap in the disparities that you see in certain communities. You know, those that are facing you know, um, lower access to care, uh, individuals and populations on uh, the lower end of the socioeconomic scale, um, some of the black and brown populations that have struggled to get uh, healthcare outcomes comparable to the rest of the population, and then really investing in a, in a data infrastructure that can really kind of bridge that divide to address um, health equity. And I think what this has all resulted in is a model that quite frankly, from our perspective, is really taking the lessons from the direct primary care community and trying to bring that into um, kind of Medicare's next evolution of, of primary care um, and value-based care. I mean, so if we go to this next slide here, you know, the way that we at Pearl think about um, kind of direct contracting, it really is kind of a blend of what has been happening in uh, the traditional uh, Medicare value-based care programs, which were this kind of like, you know, we'll group them all together in this kind of concept of an ACO in which physicians come together um, to take, a, you know, more uh, financial accountability and quality-based accountability for an assigned population with some of the features of Medicare Advantage, which is, for those of you who know, kind of a Medicare Advantage payer model, it's kind of the health plan version of Medicare um, and, and a lot of what has happened in the Medicare Advantage community, um, certainly there are Medicare Advantage plans that operate like a traditional health plan, kind of giving fee-for-service payments out into um, doctors, and you kind of get into that rate negotiation. But there has been a very large kind of space where a lot of Medicare Advantage plans have partnered with physicians to give this kind of like PMPM subscription type model to primary care practices. And, and that has been very, very successful both for patients um, it has been successful providers in that model, and it's been a kind of interesting and innovative model that the Medicare Advantage community has created. And, and so now I think that what the, the Medicare um, proper, traditional Medicare uh, models are looking at is how do we blend the, the learnings of those MA, you know, PMPM PM kind of risk-based arrangements coupled with the goals of improving healthcare outcomes and reducing costs uh, to create this new uh, program um, which, which is now um, kind of direct contracting that builds off what we think are a lot of the lessons from the direct primary care, care community. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jen to let her talk a little bit about how some of these programs kind of overlap with, with DPC. Great, thanks on Keith. And as Zach put in the chat, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and we can either answer them through the presentation or uh, at the end we can do some, some Q&A, but we really wanna make sure we're leaving you with a solid understanding of direct contracting. So we've uh, outlined here how both ACOs, kind of the, the uh, more traditional value-based care program and direct contracting, the new program, how those kind of lay out against DPC along some different dimensions. So let me just walk through those quickly for you. So number one, the payment model. This is, I think, the, really the biggest sea change. You know, a lot of my background prior to Hint is um, in the ACO world, and, and this is the thing I was most excited about when I saw 
the direct contracting model come out and started learning more is really moving away from fee for service. So in the ACO world, yes, there are shared savings and there's an opportunity for the provider to you kind of share in, in the savings that they are generating, but the core of their revenue, their revenue stream throughout the year is still from fee for service. So it didn't really change that underlying uh, kind of system, whereas direct contracting does in, in sense that it's giving a capitated or a monthly PMPM to primary care providers, which is obviously very similar to the model that most of you are employing in DPC already. So a lot of alignment in the payment model. And then the world of quality uh, management and documentation. So last I checked in, in ACOs, I believe there's like 34, 35 different measures. Some are just for a process. Did you do a thing? Some are about an outcome. Did, did you help a patient achieve a certain clinical outcome? Uh, but regardless, there is a lot of work that actually goes along, not only with tracking all of these, but reporting out on them at the end of the year with chart pulls and manual attestation and you know, really a lot of work that goes along with those 35 different quality measures. And then in the world of DCE, another, you know, something I was very happy to see as a, sort of an evolution of the program, there are far fewer measures. And those that are there are outcomes focused, mostly centered around admissions and readmissions. So they're all claims based, there's no chart pulls. Um, kind of get rid of this, you know, kind of checklist, if you will, um, the, you know, the, the results from those 34, 35 different measures. And then they're also centered around the patient experience and patient satisfaction, which I think the DPC community is, you know, already extremely well suited to, to do well in those measures based on the model and just based on, you know, what we know about the high NPS for, uh, for patients in the direct primary care model, of, of which I am one. Um, and then, you know, kind of third down there, billing and Medicare participation. So, you know, this is an important note for the DPC community that, you know, in the ACO program, as well as in the direct contracting program, you do need to be a participating um, provider with Medicare. So that's just, you know, a, a consideration. Are you opted out? Are you, you know, did you stay opted in? Uh, but you need, do need to be a participating provider um, with Medicare. Um, a little bit about the attribution model. So how are patients kind of aligned or assigned in this model? And I think there's been a real nice evolution here as well. So in the ACO world, it's all what's called claims-based alignment. So they look at, you know, based on the claims, who, which patients, which beneficiaries have you been providing care to? They use, you know, you know, their own algorithm to say, okay, we're going to align these patients with these particular providers. But what happens if, you know, patients who you are actively seeing and treating don't end up on that list, um, they don't end up kind of counting, you know, in your alignment under the program. So in the world of direct contracting, claims-based alignment is still employed, but there's also a new mechanism, voluntary alignment, where, you know, say there is a patient, a Medicare beneficiary that you are seeing and you're treating and they want to be aligned to you, that they can do so with Medicare either online or on a paper-based process. So that gets it a little bit closer to, you know, that patient choice that's so important in the world of DPC, you know, whether it's, you know, through an employer or through um, a consumer uh, relationship that you might have. So, so some nice evolution there as well, putting the hand, you know, putting some control back in the hands of the patients as well in terms of where, um, where and who they're aligned. Regarding network, another important differentiator here, there is no closed network or, you know, some of the, the kind of traditional health plan mechanisms here in terms of where the patient can go. So the patients can still have, they have all the same traditional rights and benefits of being a traditional Medicare member. We can create preferred networks as part of this program, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few slides, but there is no limitation on who the patient can see. And I think that's a really important thing, you know, about aligning, um, aligning with the DPC models that we're really still trying to empower the patient here. Uh, supplemental patient benefits. So in the ACO world, there, there aren't these supplemental benefits or the opportunity to deliver them. This is one of the pieces of the Medicare Advantage plans that um, have been successful and that we see now being incorporated into direct contracting, where on top of the traditional Medicare coverage, we can um, offer supplemental benefits, which I'll double click on a little bit in a few slides as well. So additional things we can offer to patients on top of their coverage. We know that many of you are already doing this in your practices, whether that's you're offering additional services within your practice, maybe within the membership, maybe outside the membership, as well as accessing, you know, different services or providers outside your walls, um, you know, in the practice as well. So some nice alignment there. 
And then really last, changes to patient insurance. There are no changes to the, the members insurance coverage here, um, which is you know, definitely a positive. We're not trying to limit their coverage or limit, limit their choice um, in this model. So they have the same traditional patient insurance um, that they would through traditional Medicare. All right, so that was, I know, a mouthful. So if there are any questions on that, please, you know, definitely put them in the chat so that we can uh, get them answered for you. Justice, if you want to go to the next slide, that'd be great. Thank you. So in terms of, you know, Ankit has already mentioned um, a little bit about this for you, but how we, you know, you know, why we're so excited and honestly, what made me so excited about um, direct contracting and trying to, you know, in both directions, introduce new, um, whether it's a new revenue stream or the ability to move more of your practice into direct care if you're operating in a hybrid model um, through, through the direct contracting program with, you know, pulling everybody, you know, into that care model and that revenue model that you've already made the choice to move to. Uh, helping you take risks. So as, you know, we open the presentation with, we already do know that you are providing value not only to the patients, right? So we, that's very clear that the patients are receiving a lot of value through their relationship with you, but you are actually helping the broader system. You are helping reduce utilization and costs. We've seen multiple studies that some of you have generated from your own practices as well as last year's uh, study done by Milliman, but you, you know, don't get to share in, uh, you know, reap the rewards that, that you're creating for the system and that this model does allow you to do that and share in the savings that Medicare is receiving through the great care that you're providing to patients. And last, in, in kind of exchange for taking on risk, uh, you know, as is traditional in these, in these programs from Medicare, um, we will, as the DCE, receive full medical history on your beneficiary. So everyone who's, who's listed as an active and aligned beneficiary, we will get three years of historical claims data as well as ongoing weekly or monthly updates so that we can give you a full view of where your patients are going, what kinds of services they're accessing, and who they're accessing them from, which I know has is, is always been a bit of a challenge. I know some employers are able to give this data when you've got contracts with them, uh, but this, this is something I think is a, a huge benefit of these programs and that, you know, as we are starting to build out our product that we'll be kind of ingesting and being able to present to you. Um, so a lot of, you know, nice benefits here um, that align with DPC, but also help kind of grow grow the model and reward you for the benefit that you're providing. Sorry, go ahead, Justice. Thank you. And again, I won't um, spend a lot of time on the slide. This is something you already know well that, you know, the model helps move from a volatile revenue stream, which COVID brought obviously into stark relief, you know, dependent on the visit, dependent on volume, and really stabilizes the core revenue stream in addition to allowing you to share in the savings. So, so again, you, you, you all are already here where we're trying to do is help you grow, you know, even more and help doctors who are more in the traditional model move into this world that you've already started creating. Great, if you want to go to the next slide. And just to dive a little deeper on some of these supplemental benefits. So as I mentioned, this is one of the, the more successful and popular components of the Medicare Advantage offerings. Um, cannot offer these through the ACO program. We can offer them through direct contracting, and those take a you know, couple different shapes and forms, whether they be allowed uh, Medicare waivers that we can approve you know, for certain of their current policies or sort of additive benefits or benefit enhancements as it's called in the program. So those can take the shape of reduced co-pays for patients. So again, we're not gonna close down the network, but if there are preferred providers that we would wanna build that preferred network with you, um, we can use reduced cost sharing as a way to encourage members to wanna use those providers without, again, limiting their choice. Different kinds of wellness benefits, you know, we've heard about dental benefits being something that would be really popular to be able to add on to this. Social determinant benefits, transportation is one that comes up quite a bit. And then other kind of care coordination and chronic care management services for those patients that might fit into very high needs buckets or need very specialized care. But the goal here is to really build with you what is needed in your community with patients or your community of patients and to be able to construct the right benefit enhancements for you. Right. And then um, some of the requirements. So we've touched on these a little bit. So obviously, you know, you need to be participating with Medicare, need to be opted into Medicare to do this. And number two, I know sounds a bit ironic since we've just been talking about moving to per member per month versus um, visit-based payments. Uh, the difference here being claims do need to be submitted to Medicare for any visits that you do do with patients. 
you know, largely as a data collection mechanism. They're not going to remit payment to you based on that claim, but some of the really important information that they need in order to run and monitor the program, including diagnosis codes, so they understand the acuity of your patients, what services are being provided. This all goes into how they calculate the PMPM. It goes into how they calculate shared savings. Uh, so it, the claim still exists as a bit of a, you know, kind of data transfer vehicle. I know some of you already do this, the kind of $0 claims to TPAs for employer clients, um, but that is something that um, is, is good to understand, you know, for this community, since I know, you know, most of the time you are not having to submit bills for the work that you're doing. And then, of course, as, as part of being a participating Medicare provider, adhering to the Medicare guidelines around documentation and care management. So, you know, that is a little bit of a step back into, into this world, but with some very significant differences that, that we've covered. So that's a lot about direct contracting and to talk a little bit about Pearl Health and what we're planning on doing. You know, one of the things that, that is very, very important to us and is really part of our mission is to support and enable primary care providers to stay autonomous and independent. We're not trying to take over the practice. We're not trying to buy the practice. We're not trying to say, you know, these are the clinical workflows that you must follow. Um, really important to us that we are enabling you to practice medicine the way that you want to and that we can enable you to get access to, um, to you know, this potentially new stream of patients um, and, and the revenue, but also, you know, maintaining the, the way that you want to practice. So I think that's one big differentiator uh, for us in terms of our move into direct contracting. You know, we are not an HMO. Direct contracting is, you know, totally the opposite of, of an HMO. Um, we are different from ACOs in the ways that we've already mentioned. And again, you know, this is about supporting your independence and enabling you to take advantage of this program rather than trying to be, you know, overly prescriptive about, you know, how you're going to practice and how you're going to run your practice and treat your patients. And then, you know, you know, again, there's benefits of just being in direct contracting and then, you know, additive benefits doing direct contracting with Pearl. So, you know, a couple of the things that we're working on, we, we're working on creating a robust technology platform to take all of that data that we were talking about, add in data. So that could be anything from data, you know, that you're using in Spruce about how often you are connecting with your patients outside of the visit. That's something that we're really interested in learning more about. Um, what's kind of happening outside the visit. It could be layering and data from the local hospital. It could be prescription data, lab data, um, really any data we can get our hands on to lay on that foundation of the claims data we'll be receiving from Medicare. You know, building different tools on top of that to, to enable you to be successful in the program. And then on the bottom there, you know, different kind of services that we can also provide. So helping you um, build out your preferred network. I know many of you already have your own you know, essentially preferred network, how can we pull them into the program, you know, potentially implement some of those uh, waivers and benefit enhancements like the reduced cost sharing to, to help put some structure around that for you. Regulatory assistance, you would not be alone in, you know, navigating the, the regulatory waters here with CMS. That's what we're here to do and make it, you know, really easy and um, seamless for you to participate. And then risk guidance and, uh, and protection. So if you are entering or re-entering back into the world of some of your revenue being at risk, we want to partner with you and support you in doing that, give you, you know, clear, transparent information about where you stand and the different things that you can do to help, um, help increase your shared savings. So, you know, lots of technology services uh, that we'll be adding just to the benefits that exist throughout the program as well. Right. And I definitely will not go over each one of these boxes for you, but this is, you know, kind of the landscape of the building blocks that we'll be building out uh, at Pearl. So really starting on the far left with just how do we grow the program that's kind of in the mode that we're in right now and identifying providers who want to participate and want to participate with Pearl. Once we're live in the program, that second column from the left, you know, where we would be integrating um, with Hint for those of you on Hint so that you can receive the members who've been aligned to you, either through claims or voluntary alignment. They're going to show up right in your Hint account, along with any of the other uh, patients that are coming in through any of your other streams. And payment in administration, how can we administer this uh, PMPM? Again, in the same way that you receive payment from your employers or networks or any other party that uh, that you are integrated with. And then everything over there um, on the right, all the things that we're going to be building out and doing with all of this data that we have to bring to bear to you as, you know, kind of additive uh, to everything you have with Hint and your other tools. 
Great. And just, uh, you know, quick highlights on the team, you know, from um, the team at Pearl, we're coming from, you know, all different corners of healthcare, really all aligned around this mission of trying to shift the world of the primary care provider closer to the one that all of you have already created. And you're certainly providing a lot of inspiration for, uh, for our team. But, you know, we, we come from lots of different uh, places in healthcare, technology, insurance, um, different data uh, backgrounds, finance backgrounds. So, you know, really pulling that all together in order to support uh, both support you, but also support, you know, your colleagues who, who want to make the shift and how can we use this as a, le as a lever to do that. All right, and this is our last slide. And then I see we've got a couple of questions that we can go into and, and, you know, looking forward to any questions you have or concerns that we can help address. So, you know, what comes next? If you've heard anything today that sounds interesting to you and your, your interest has peaked, um, the next step would be for you to reach out, you know, to us. You can email us, you can call us. The Hint team certainly has all of our emails. And what the next step would look like is we would actually, you know, based on some historical data we already have uh, from CMS, we can kind of lay out based on your own NPI, what would the program look like for you? What do the, you know, what would your um, costs look like according to the benchmarks for your area? What might the PM PM look like? Where are your areas of opportunity? So we can run a personalized analysis for you, just so you can learn a little bit more about the program and how it applies, you know, to you and to your practice. And we've already done, you know, a high number of these with different providers throughout, throughout the year. There's no commitment to do that. It just helps you learn a little bit more um, to, to decide if this is something that you want to do. Should you want to proceed, we would sign a definitive agreement with you due by September. So um, we are coming up on that deadline, but we've still got some time to do the review with you. We would take you through kind of a readiness program and assessment and, and you know, preparation activities throughout the remainder of Q3 and Q4. And then participation, the performance year goes uh, goes live on 1-1-22. So that's when you would start tracking towards your shared savings and when you would start receiving the PM PM payments for your patients. So, you know, the only immediate next step, if you're interested, is to let us know and we can run that personalized analysis for you. That is all we've got on the presentation part, but let's go look into some questions here. Yeah, so thanks so much, Jen and Ankit. Um, there's been a, a bunch of questions coming through here. So I'm going to just read them out for the benefit of everyone, and then you guys can, can answer them. So the first question here is from Stephen Bishop. How would it work for a new solo practice? Can I recruit and enroll new patients throughout the year? Keith, you want to take that one or you want me to take that one? Yeah, let me, let me just kind of offer that um, kind of one piece here. The program does allow for... Um, a process by which a Medicare patient can select you as the primary care doctor, um, in which point they would kind of quote, be enrolled in the program through your practice. Um, you know, the one thing to note there, you know, is, is making sure that you are being very consistent um, and not sort of picking and choosing, you know, Medicare does have non-discrimination rules um, and just making sure you're not sort of selectively choosing which patients you wanted to, to sort of bring into your practice. But, but once a Medicare patient comes in, um, giving the opportunity to sort of enroll in, um, in, in through your practice. Great, thanks Ankit. There's another question here from David Olson. As to the claims submitted to Medicare, how, how thorough do they have to be? I.e. do they have to, to have all the supplemental codes for preventative care and other quality measures or simply diagnosis, procedures and e &M codes? Do these claims have significant impact? I, do they need to be optimized in some way? Yeah, so I'll, I'll offer that there's not, in, in the way that you may have been um, kind of living in a previous fee-for-service world or rev cycle kind of management or rev cycle optimization, that there is not a need for that kind of optimization. Um, again, because for these primary care codes, um, the services are going to be reimbursed at a rate of, you know, zero dollars. Um, you know, all that's to say is that Medicare is asking for the bills to be submitted. Um, it's not intended for uh, data to not be captured and collected. I, you know, my, my read, um, you know, speaking a little bit about a term, but my kind of reading between the lines of what Medicare is trying to get at here is really to kind of collect information um, to understand what the touch points are so that they can kind of do their own, um, their own data analytics. You know, I will say from our point, just as a side note to that, I think one of the things that we are, you know, excited about with the partnership with Hint here is that 
our hope is that over the next couple of years, we have the ability to go to Medicare and, and share with them that the direct primary care community is truly providing above and beyond better healthcare outcomes for the patients that they are treating um, and, and to use um, the data under this program to encourage them to create more programs that can uh, you know, be conducive to the DPC community um, in a way that, that they haven't um, in the past. And, and hopefully this program you know, may not have everything, just to be quite frank about it. I'm not gonna try to sell this as the end all be all, but we think that for some practices, it is a meaningful first step. And I think it's a good indication that if we do this well and we do this right, um, we can sort of start having that conversation with Medicare in a way that we haven't been able to in the past. Yeah, and I'll just reinforce that. That's one of the reasons we've been so excited about partnering with Pearl here because of the sort of authenticity they've shown towards really trying to support this community. Um, and, and we've also kind of working hard in the background to make sure that for our clients, it's really seamless for them. And, and it sort of almost like feels from an operational perspective, feels as close to what their standard business model is, um, given that there are some obviously constraints there. Um, so it's, it's exciting to see that unfold. Um, we've got another question here from uh, Lito. How can Pearl Health, how can Pearl Health help us grow membership in our practice? What's the timing for this to begin? Great. So I can fill in any blanks here, but I think that you know how we were just describing the voluntary alignment for a new practice would be the same pathway for gaining additional members in your practice. So there are you know some some you know definite rules and sort of guidelines to ensure that, you know, nothing, you know, uh, unintended consequences, you know, of, of uh, the voluntary alignment program occur. Uh, but there are, you know, ways that you can grow your membership with Medicare members, you know, here. And as far as the timing, so the program, the performance here starts on January 1st, 2022. And I can get back to you on the answer of, you know, how often members are aligned to you. That can be a follow-up question and unless on Keith, you happen to know the answer. Uh, to that, but the program starts on January 1st, and then there, there are kind of timing considerations around when the voluntary, voluntarily aligned patients would be officially attributed to you. Yes, I, th I think that's right. It's going to vary a little bit um, based on kind of selections that you have, whether you want to have members added annually, whether you want to have members added quarterly. Um, but, but the one thing I will say just in terms of um, kind of your practice's membership you know, I, I think one of the things that we think a lot about from the Medicare perspective is there, there is you, not a community in this country where there are Medicare members who have growing healthcare needs um, and they are in search of doctors who are able to give them the time and attention in a way that they have not been able to. We, we are facing a growing and aging population. Um, and, and so I think one thing to keep in mind is just by kind of reaccepting and kind of being open to Medicare members. If you've got space and availability on your panel. Um, you know, I, I would be very shocked and surprised if you did not have uh, Medicare members kind of outreaching to understand kind of your practice model um, and then how they might be able to start engaging and receiving care from you. Great, awesome. Um, so how does this affect my patients? So what is the, you know, what is the impact on their insurance coverage? Um, does, you know, is there anything that would impact their ability to access care or cost sharing or supplemental medical plans, Medicaid plans, I mean? Yeah, so, so they retain, beneficiaries retain all the same rights and coverage as they have in traditional Medicare. So they're, they're, you know, we can't add prior offs. We're not going to be able to say, you can't go see these certain providers. So if anything, it's, it's additive to the coverage that they already have. They will be notified. It will be one of our obligations in DCE to notify them that they, you know, that their provider is participating in this program and that they've been aligned, you know, to them. So that's part of our obligation is to notify patients, but there are no, you know, changes to their actual coverage. So, you know, the goal here is that they really see it as additive that their provider is participating and not that it, it you know, doesn't take anything away from them. Great. Um, there's another question here from uh, David Olson. Once you opt back into Medicare, can you require that you accept Medicare patients only via the Pearl Health pathway? Short answer is no. I, I think that when you sign the Medicare um, conditions, it, it sort of comes back down to um, the non-discrimination provisions that I had described before. 
Now, certainly if you are enrolled in this program, um, for every patient that you are treating, um, you will be eligible to sort of align them into this model um, and, and kind of have them be part of the direct contracting program. So, um, you know, I want to be careful to kind of not misrepresent Medicare's intentions, but, but the functional answer is that if you are serving as the primary care doctor and the patient is willing to acknowledge that, um, then, then they will be in the program. The, the main thing I just want to be careful that I communicate is that the government is very concerned about not having kind of discriminatory practices where a doctor is saying to one Medicare patient, yes, I will take you on, but saying to another Medicare patient, I won't take you on, you know, to the extent that the doctor has space on their panel to take on more patients. I mean, certainly no one's asking a doctor to take on 20,000 patients, but wanting to make sure that all patients are being treated fairly. Yeah, and I think that's that aligns, I think, really well with with our community anyway. You know, uh, our community is in this to help patients, so I, I don't see that being an intention. But that clarification, I think, is really, really, really good one. Um, there's a question here from uh, Catherine Cantaway. I haven't seen many Medicare patients in the past few years at my DPC clinic, so how would you help me figure out how I would initially fit into this program? So I would say the best course of action here would be for you to, you know, let's set up a time to meet with you one-on-one because -on -one, we actually can do an analysis. You know, we, we would need your NPI, but we can do an analysis for you to see what that looks like if, you know, based on on um, kind of our modeling of the alignment methodology from CMS, if any patients would in fact still be claims aligned to you or not, and what that would look like and what the pathways are, you know, if, if that's um, not within that window and, and they would not end up being claims aligned. So I would say if you're interested, we can actually do an analysis directly on your data and, and help figure that question out for you. Great. Uh, there's another question here from um, David Olson, who's going to win the prize for the most questions. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> um, so um, the, the, this question is, is the PMPM risk adjusted for each patient? I might just add to that question a little bit. Are there any shared savings and do I need to take any downside risk? So um, again, let me try to answer and then I keep please, uh, you know, fill in any blanks uh, that I've got here. So the PMPM itself is not risk adjusted for each patient. However, there is a, a component of the program called the benchmark, which is set based on the acuity of your panel, which is where risk adjustment comes in, you know, and the, there's a lot of math and kind of complicated formulas in terms of how the benchmark is set. But, you know, at the end of the day, it exists so that if you did have a higher acuity panel, that benchmark is higher, they'd expect you to be treating those patients and making sure that they were getting all of the services they need. Whereas if the acuity of your panel was lower, you know, the opposite would be true. So it does not impact your PMPM. -PM it impacts the benchmark, which is then what actually impacts have you achieved shared savings or not. So, you know, again, simply put, there's a lot of, you know, kind of math and, and different things that go on behind the scenes here. But if the spend for your panel is over your benchmark, then you would not achieve shared savings. If the spend for your panel is under the benchmark, that's when you would be achieving shared savings. And so to answer the other part of your question, Zach, those shared savings end up being shared with, between Medicare and the direct contracting entity. And then depending on the arrangement that we put together between the direct contracting entity and the participating provider, those savings get shared as well. So, so you know, the, the savings part go to Medicare, part go to the DCE, and then the DCE shares those savings with the provider as well. And that the, the degree of which they're saved, um, which they're shared, there are potential, depending on the appetite of the, the participating provider, if they want to go at downside risk and potentially have, you know, the ability to retain more of those shared savings, but also put themselves at downside risk. So all things are possible, but it really depends a lot on your own risk tolerance. And that's where, you know, when we can look at your own data, you'd see kind of where you would, where you would lie in the, in the program to help inform that decision. Maybe just a follow-up question on that, Jen, um, for Chad um, Nugent, um, is, is this open, sorry, can you go into any of the details of your fees for patients enrolling through you? Sure. And Keith, you want to take that one or you want me yeah, to let me, let me offer sure. kind of the, the fees. Um, it, it, so there's a lot of variability here. I, I will be clear about the role that Pearl and Hint are playing, um, which is we are trying to provide a technology platform 
to support practices who are enrolling in, in this program and this type of arrangement. From, from the fee perspective, it really comes down to that per member per month. And, and, and you know, I, I think it's variable to the geography that you are operating in. Um, what this ultimately comes down to is that the per member per month um, amount that you get is determined by uh, formulas that Medicare will create that are adjusted for wages in a given area. So the, the bottom line, to put it very simply, is that the PMPM might be incrementally larger in downtown Manhattan um, than it would be, say, um, in, in a town in, in Topeka, Kansas, let's say. Um, and, and we're happy to kind of walk you through that number and what those numbers look like. Um, and then for us, our fees are really just kind of tied to, from the technology platform perspective, um, you know, a small amount to kind of distribute the funds and give you the data analytics. Um, but again, it's tied to that PM PM. We're not, you know, we want to be sensitive to kind of the local market um, um, pricing that has been set by, by Medicare. Um, all that's to say is that there's also kind of an opportunity for us to kind of structure pricing in a way that, you know, we can backload it, so to speak, so that we can, you know, the fees can be paid out of shared savings that come um, on the other side. So you go through the full year, if you're performing and you generate savings, there's fees that can be that can come out of that savings bonus payment rather than just kind of entirely upfront. And we kind of walk through that um, kind of arrangement with you if you kind of get in touch with us. Um, and then the one other side note that I just want to say, which might be is somewhat related, but just kind of gives you insight into how we've been thinking about this. Um, we sort of came to this conversation because we met a number of DPC practices. It was almost kind of coincidental to some extent, um, but we got in touch with Zach and, and, and Jen here and sort of mentioned what was going on and kind of pulled that thread a little bit harder where there were DPC practices who had some Medicare patients who were going to a DPC practice, even though the DPC was not actually accepting or billing Medicare. But nonetheless, we were still able to grab data on those patients and what we were able to see is that, you know, it was a very handful number of doctors that we saw, but the savings performance for those DPC practice for those Medicare patients was just absolutely mind boggling compared to what everyone in the world of Medicare is so accustomed to seeing. I mean, we were looking at numbers where if you have a Medicare panel on a doctor, you expect like a 20% readmission rate, meaning that every time a doctor's patient goes to the hospital, you'd expect 20% of those patients to be back in the hospital within 30 days of the initial hospital visit. And for these DPC practices, I mean, it was like less than 2% of the patients would be back in the hospital when, within 30 days. And we just called up these doctors and just said, can you just help me understand what's going on here? And, and you know, for them, it was just sort of a no brainer. It's like, well, they once they got discharged from the hospital, we did a very lengthy follow-up with them. We spent an hour and we did multiple touch points for over you know, the next two to three weeks to make sure that they were stabilized. And that's probably, you know, of course they would not go back to the hospital because we're, you know, managing them very aggressively um, from a healthcare outcome perspective following that discharge. Um, and, and it's sort of kind of indicative when we kind of tie that in with fees. I think one of the things that we wanted to stress to the community is that there, there's sort of a general sense that we have that direct, you know, primary care practices clinical model is already set up to kind of be very successful um, in this type of arrangement. Um, and there's one other question here from Chow. That, by the way, that's a phenomenal statistic. Um, really, really amazing. Um, another question here from Chow. Um, is this only open to patients who are not on an EMA plan? Yes. So it is open to traditional patients who are still in traditional Medicare. So if, they, if they've chosen Medicare, uh, Part C and Medicare Advantage, then they would not be able to be an aligned beneficiary. The provider could still be seeing them, but outside of this program. Got it. Great. Uh, and we've got a question here from Jason Lassen. Any idea what the average PM premium rate is from Medicare? Is it based on various factors, local location, utilization, et cetera, or, or is any of that known yet? Also, how is Pell compensated? Well, we've, we've spoken about this piece, so maybe just um, the first piece. Yeah. Oh, no, actually, how's Pell Commons? Flat monthly fee percentage of active Medicare members. Okay, yeah, you can perhaps address that a little bit. Yeah, so let me, let me offer, the reason I kind of like talk a little bit about the um, kind of need for us to talk and, and the kind of variability, um, 
the, the way Medicare operates in this program, and it's a little bit, um, I'm a little glossing over some of um, the math behind it, but what they essentially say is, you know, 2020 was a pandemic year. So what they've done is they've gone to 2019 and they say, you know, hey, doctor, in your market, we are looking for you specifically, you know, Dr. Dr. Holdsworth, how much primary care services and revenue did you have in 2019? And Medicare has all that data because for a traditional, you know, fee-for-service doctor, they're billing Medicare annually. And so they say in 2019, you billed, you know, $100 per patient per month. And so what we Medicare are going to do is we're just going to make this revenue neutral. We're just going to give you the same amount of money that you billed in 2019 that you, you know, in, in 2022, and then you'll get an opportunity to have additional dollars on top of that through the shared savings and bonus payment um, that Jen had kind of previously um, discussed and described. The, the reason we, we, we're being, you know, wanting to suggest that we have a direct conversation is that th there is a different pathway, and this is kind of where Pearl and Hint's partnership comes in, where if you do not have that 20 uh, 19 experience because you were not expect, accepting Medicare, you were not billing Medicare. But what we would have to do um, is kind of do some math on the local market and, and understand how CMS Medicare is calculating the county rate. Um, and we would kind of calculate that number um, for you based on that. Um, but if you are someone who, ha you know, maybe you are a practice that has a model that is already accepting Medicare. If you're in that type of model, the, the short and simple answer would be, it's just simply calculated based on what your primary care billing services were per patient per month in 2019. And, and the government will just sort of make it revenue neutral under this program. Okay, great. Um, there's a, a question here from Janine Rodems. We are about 25% Medicare patients. I don't know if, if it is worth the back um, the back work and exposure to Medicare billing again, but our patients are well aware of the amount of access to us and the continuity from the hospital. We are also adamant our patients which maintain that continuity. Oh, sorry, we also admit our patients which maintain that con continuity. That is a benefit that they recognize, which is why they, we have a large population in our practice. We know we are saving Medicare money. That delta is in the saved amounts would be interesting information for the DPC community. Absolutely. So what I would recommend is, you know, we should definitely follow up with you and, you know, we can show you in the data, which it sounds like, you know, you're already aware. We could show you in the data what that would look like and show you what at least the potential shared savings might look like for you, which then, you know, becomes a rubric for you of understanding, hey, is it, if you're already doing this, you're not able to reap the rewards of saving Medicare all this money in the program you could. Um, you know, is that going to be worth, you know, going back into, into the world of at least, you know, submitting the claims, you know, maybe not, you know, receiving the payment and kind of the, the up and down revenue, but um, we would be happy to talk about that with you. And again, this is just, you know, all we would need to do is schedule a little bit of time with you and be able to share that analysis so we could show that to you. Um, you know, there is variability again across the, the DPC community. We've done some work to, to say sort of what's happening in the broader community of DPC, but we could make this specific to you. Uh, in a, in a follow-up. Great, right, we're coming up on time here in a few minutes. There's just a, a time for one or two more questions here. So one here from Chow uh, Nugan. Are we penalized if our DC patients go see another primary care doc? Go ahead, Anki. Yes, so sorry. So I, I will say that uh, you're not penalized. Um, I think the thing that uh, we'd want to emphasize here and part of that alignment form that we previously discussed is one, uh, you know, making sure the patient confirms that you are the primary care doctor who is responsible for managing their care. Um, you know, certainly, you know, it's a very common thing in the over 65 population. Um, you know, you might be in New York, but you're spending three months out of the year in Florida and you have a primary care doctor down there. Um, so there's no penalty for that. Um, so, you know, and the patient will still be enrolled in the program as long as they indicate you as the, as a primary care doctor. Um, but, but of course that primary care doctor down in Florida would still bill Medicare, um, and that would count towards sort of the expenditures, um, that, that, that patient is sort of kind of accruing, uh, through the year. Great. I think we've got time for one more question here. Uh, you, hi, Sang Lee, hopefully I got that right. Um, other than PMPM, PM, will there be carved out? 
Will they be carved out for office procedures and inpatient visits? Yep. So um, in if there is a set of codes that Medicare has specified are included, if you will, in the PMPM. And then if you were to be doing other procedures or say you're rounding at the hospital, things that fall outside that list of codes, which we can provide to you if you're interested, um, you would get your normal fee-for-service payment for those procedures or for those activities that are not specified under that PMPM. So you that, hopefully that answers your question, but yes, you would still get reimbursement for, for those things that are not considered um, included under the PMPM. Great. So we're right at the top of the hour here. Thanks so much, Jen and Ankit. Super exciting to see what you're working on at Pearl. And um, thank you so much for spending the time helping educate our community here. And please reach out to the Pearl team if you'd like to learn more.